Hi, boys and girls. Welcome to another week of prep. Um, this week, we're going to talk about God's mercy and his forgiveness. Um, please make sure that you have your spirit of truth textbook and a pencil. If not, pause the recording, go find them, and then come on back and we'll get started. All right, so today we're going to talk about how God's mercy is infinite. What does that mean? God's mercy is infinite. It means God will always forgive us. He has infinite capacity to forgive no matter how much we sin or what the sin is. God can always forgive us because he is love. And Jesus gave us the sacrament of confession so that we can receive God's mercy when we sin. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And that's that little voice, your conscience, that speaks to you and helps you decide what to do, whether to do right or wrong. And so we have to listen to the Holy Spirit so that we can live rightly <clears throat> and the holy spirit is always with us guiding us through our day let's start with a prayer as usual and our prayer this week is an act of contrition and you've probably heard of the act of contrition because it's the prayer you say when you go to confession you confess your sins and the priest gives you absolution, meaning he forgives your sins. And then you say the act of contrition, which basically says, I'm sorry for my sins. Actually, I think it's the other way around. I think you do the act of contrition and then your sins are forgiven. So this is an act of contrition. You might have said a different prayer, but, but they're all pretty much similar in the, in the message, right? They all say, God, I'm really sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. So let's pray this one together. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> oh, Lord God, I hope by your grace for the pardon of all my sins. And after life here, to gain eternal happiness, because you have promised it, who are infinitely powerful, faithful, kind, and merciful. In this hope, I intend to live and die. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, think of a time when you lost something that was important to you. How did you feel when the item was lost? And how did you feel if you found it? I can tell you a story of a time when something that was important to me was lost. Um, and it was my children. <laughs> this happens to parents sometimes. Kids wander off in the grocery store or something. And for a few minutes, it's kind of scary, right? And in my case, my kids were pretty little and they were out playing on the driveway and I went in the house for a few minutes to answer the phone or something. And when I came back, they weren't there. And I called them and I walked around the outside of the house and then I went inside and I started looking on the inside of the house and I was calling their names and I was starting to panic. I was really frightened and worried. And then I finally walked into a little corner of one of the rooms and they were just sitting there reading books quietly and all was fine. And I was so happy and relieved. So, how do you feel when something is lost? You might feel sad or upset, right? Scared, like I felt that time. When something is important to you is lost, what do you do? You search for it, right? <clears throat> and when you find it, how do you feel? Happy and relieved, maybe. So 
when we turn away from God by sinning, how do you think God feels? And what does God do when we turn away from him? How does God feel when we return to him? Do you think he stays mad at us for sinning? No. God feels great happiness when sinners repent and return to him, just like we do when we found something that was lost. Because when we sin, we are turning away from God. We are lost to him. And when we say we're sorry and go to confession and he, he forgives us and then we feel happy and he feels happy. So Jesus talked about this in the Bible. He says in the book of Luke chapter 15, verse seven, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. What does that mean? It means if one person who has sinned says they're sorry and changes their ways, there is more joy in heaven for that one person than it is for all the other people who have not sinned, right? That's how happy God is to have one person return to him. I'd like you to turn to page 75 in your book and you shall see <clears throat> parables, whoops, in Luke. So turn to page 75. And I'd like you to follow along while I read this parable called The Good Shepherd. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. So this is the story that Jesus told the people. And there's that um, passage, the quote we just looked at from Luke. Jesus says, when this shepherd finds the one sheep, he is so happy, right? Just like God is happy because Jesus is the good shepherd, right? And we are his sheep. So when one of us strays and comes back to him, there is more joy in heaven over that one person who has come back than over all the others who are still there being faithful to God. Look at the next page. There's another parable there. It's called the lost coin on page 76. And again, follow along while I read this short passage. What woman having 10 coins and losing one would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, rejoice with me because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God when one sinner repents. So the story has the same message. The woman is looking for a lost coin. And back in Jesus's day, a coin was worth a lot of money. And, and people didn't have a lot of money. So this woman lost one coin and she was sweeping her house and looking everywhere for it. And then she was so happy when she found it. And in the same way, that's how God feels when we return to him. I'd like you to turn the page to 77. We have one more parable. This one's a little bit longer. 
<clears throat> so you can follow along uh, or look at the picture while I read this one. This is from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Then he said, a man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat but here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and he went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Let us celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field and on his way back, he neared the house and he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him, you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, my son, you are here with me always, and everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead, and he has come to life again. He was lost, and he has been found. So let's talk about the parable just a little bit. So there were two sons, right? The older son and the younger son. And the father was going to divide his estate his belongings between the two boys. And so the younger son said, all right, I want mine now. And so he took the money his father gave him and he took all his stuff and he went off someplace and he spent all the money, just wasted it. And then what happened? A famine struck. And what's a famine? That's, that's when everybody's hungry. They can't grow enough food. And um, there's a lot of hunger. So he didn't have any money. He couldn't buy any food. He had to spend it all. So he hired himself out as a farm worker, right? And he went and he was watching over the pigs. And the pigs had plenty to eat. And he, he wanted to eat even what the pigs were eating because he was so hungry. He didn't even have that. And that's when he wised up. And he thought, what am I doing? Even the servants in my father's house have something to eat. And here I am starving. So he decided to go back home. And when he was a little ways off, his father caught sight of him. And how do you think his father felt? He probably missed his son, right? 
I mean, back in those days, there were no cell phones. You know, there weren't any telephones at all. He probably had no idea what happened to him. And he saw his son coming and he was so happy to see him that he ran to him. And the son, what did he do? He apologized, right? He said, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers, right? He would, he'd be happy to be one of his hired workers because he would at least have something to eat. And was the father angry with him for wasting all that money? No, he wasn't, was he? He was so excited to see him that he called the servants together and he, he had them get him a beautiful robe and put a ring on his finger and they slaughtered the fattened calf and they had a big feast, a big celebration. So then we have the other son, right? And he stayed with his dad and he was working hard in the fields. And when he saw the celebrating going on because his brother who had wasted all this money um, came home, how did he feel? Well, he was angry, right? And probably kind of jealous because he said, wait a second, I've been here working for you and you don't ever give me anything to party with. You know, what's up? So what, what did the father say? He said, son, you are with me always and everything I have is yours. But right now we have to rejoice because your brother who was lost has been found. Now, what do you think is the most important part of that story? Is it the moment when the younger son came to his senses and decided to come home? Is it the moment when the father saw his son coming home in the distance? Is it the words they say to each other? Is it the older brother who was angry? Well, all the parts of the story are important, but really the most important part is the younger brother realizing he had done something wrong and saying out loud, Father, I have sinned. So, how is this parable similar to the act of contrition? Well, when we sin and we go to confession and we tell the priest our sins, then we say the act of contrition and the act of contrition says, basically, I'm really sorry for all my sins, God. So it's, it's similar to what the brother did, right? So. Think about this statement. Mercy is love that keeps on loving even when it's been rejected. So remember at the beginning of class, I said, God is infinitely merciful. Well, mercy is love that keeps on giving even when it's been rejected. So even though sometimes we sin and we reject God, we go against his ways, God keeps on loving us. And that's what mercy is. So Jesus gave us the sacrament of confession so that God could show us his mercy and we could feel his mercy right here when we're on earth. So when we turn away from God through sin, we get lost, just like the coin in the parable, just like the lost sheep, right? When we sin, we turn away from God and we're lost to him. Should we be sad and discouraged by this? Well, we should always be sad when we sin because we're hurting God and others. And we shouldn't want to do that, but we should never, ever be discouraged because God is infinitely merciful and he'll always forgive us. St. Paul writes, I'm going to show you another verse in the Bible. 
in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 20, where sin increased, grace overflowed all the more. So what St. Paul is saying is the more sin, the more mercy, right? So God's mercy is always greater than sin. No matter how many sins or how big the sin, God can always forgive us if we just say we're sorry and repent and promise never to do it again. So Jesus and God look for us when we're lost. And they send the Holy Spirit to help us return. And remember I said at the beginning, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And, and when you do something that you know is not right, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you saying, mm, mm, mm. you might feel a little bit guilty. Yeah, that's God's grace saying, oh, please don't get lost. Come on back to me. Please don't sin. Um, and when we say the act of contrition, we promise we're going to try to avoid these sins. No, we're not always successful, but it's important to always try. So when you go to confession, the priest acts in the person of Jesus. That means that when you're talking to the priest, you are talking to a man, but he's acting in the person of Jesus. It's like you're talking to Jesus, not like you're talking to just a regular person. And he acts in Jesus's place to absolve you of your sins. And then when your sins are absolved, after you say the act of contrition and the priest absolves you from your sins, you feel really happy, right? You just have a lightness and you think, oh, thank goodness, I've got a clean slate and um, I'm going to really try not to do these sins anymore. And not only that, but God is happy because you were lost to him and now you're found just like the father in the parable when his son came back to him. So please turn to page 79 in your book. And it says examination of conscience at the top. Okay, so an examination of conscience you might remember is what you do to help you prepare to go to the sacrament of confession. And uh, at the top there, it says um, directions, pray to the Holy Spirit to help you know what your sins are and help you to avoid them in the future. So then there's a little prayer that you can say, and um, you should take some time before you go to confession to examine your conscience. And, and using these two pages in the book will be very helpful. All right, first you say that little prayer, and then you'll see that there are two columns on each page. And on the left-hand side is the, 10 commandments, right? The first three commandments are on page 79 and the next, all the rest of the commandments are on page 80, okay? In the left-hand column. And on the right-hand column are some questions that you can ask yourself. So you can kind of check and see, oops, did I make any of these mistakes? Did I do any of these sins? For instance, the first one, I am the Lord, your God, you shall not have other gods before me. That's the first commandment, right? And then you look over in the right-hand column. The question is, have I let someone influence my choices more than God? Have I let somebody else be more important than God? All right. So you can ask yourself that. Hmm. Did my friends lead me astray from, you know, something I knew that God wouldn't want me to do, right? Or um, 
did I watch a TV show that was showing bad things and that led me to do some things I shouldn't have done? All right. Or maybe it was a song that you listened to on your iPod or whatever. Okay. So that, that's a question you can ask yourself. And then as you go through these questions, you can kind of make a little mental list of what your sins are, or you could even write them down if you want, but it's private. You can just keep it to yourself. You don't have to tell your parents or anybody else. So um, the reason I bring this all up is because there's a special event coming up in our parish where you are going to have the chance to go to confession. And it's Tuesday night, this Tuesday, December 7th, from 6.15 to 7.30 in the church. There are gonna be confessions for prep students. You can go there with your parents or whoever can take you. And, and your parents or your other family members are welcome to go to confession too. If you can't make that, or if you already, um, you know, you watch this video too late and it's, it's past the seventh, there's going to be another chance during the Christmas time period, which is on Saturday, December 18th, between 10 a.m. and noon. Monsignor and probably another priest will be in the church for confessions then. And then just in general, a half hour before every mass, you can always go to confession every Saturday evening and Sunday. So it's really important, especially when there are uh, important celebrations in the church, like at Christmas and Easter time, that you go to confession and you just wipe your soul clean. And then you feel really good about yourself and you're preparing your soul for God's coming at Christmas time. So I, I highly recommend you tell your parents you'd like to go to confession. If you forget how to do it, uh, I'm sure they can review it with you. Um, and just remember that the priest, when you're talking to him, he's acting in the person of Jesus. So you're just talking to Jesus and he has infinite mercy and will always forgive you if you confess your sins with an open heart and try your best not to do it again and say you're sorry, of course. So today we talked about how God's mercy is infinite, right? No bounds to his mercy. And we all make mistakes. Everybody sins. Um, and when we sin, it makes God sad because it hurts him and it hurts other people too. But we can always go to confession and we tell God we're sorry. And then it makes you feel better and it makes God feel better. So we have one more lesson until Christmas. And I will see you next week. God bless you.